you later. Uh, 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 Alex Ray. I'm a marine science student at the University of Delaware. Um, this summer I spent my internship at the Southwest Science Fisheries Center in La Jolla, California, studying the aspects of the physiology and the ecology of the Opa Lampras Vitatis. Um, so today I'm going to give you a little bit of background and switching on here. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the fish and then really dive into the research questions that I addressed over my course at La Jolla. Um, and then I'll describe the methods and the results of these research questions. Um, so the opa is a large mesopelagic fish. Um, it is found worldwide, as you can see by the map below, with the red areas being where the opa is more prevalent. Um, it is commercially fished, uh, primarily in the Pacific, although it's not a primary target. It is a secondary bycatch fish um, from the um, tuna and the swordfish longline industries. Um, although it is worldwide and commercially important, little is known about the basic biology and ecology of the fish. Um, and one of the reasons I was interested in the fish is that it is one of the few that is endothermic. Endothermic fish is fairly rare. Only about 0.1 of all fish species um, are endothermic, and these fish include tuna, marlin, and swordfish. Um, and these fish are regionally endothermic in that they only are able to, be, to maintain an elevated internal temperature in certain regions of their body. The opa, on the other hand, was recently discovered to be whole body endothermic in that it's, whole, it's able to warm its entire body. Um, all these fish share a similar structure and it, that allows them to keep these um, temperatures elevated and that is called the reading morabili. So the reading morabili is Latin for our wonderful net. It is a network of blood vessels that run anti-parallel to each other with warm blood crossing with cold blood. Um, and that enables the heat to be exchanged between the two blood vessels. Um, so this figure below shows a, is a heat schematic of an endothermic and an exo ectothermic fish, with the red being warm blood and the blue being colder blood. So in most ectothermic fish, heat is produced in the tissues and then it is lost in the gills. However, in endothermic fish, heat is produced in the tissues, but then maintained and regionally conserved via the reed. Um, so the heat is, is, stays within the, the tissues that it's produced. Um, so this metabolic heat is produced by metabolic reactions, and as we all know, oxygen is required for these metabolic reactions to occur. So how do fish obtain their oxygen? Well, fish have a structure called the gills, which I'm sure you've heard. Um, and gills are composed of four gill arches on either side of the fish's head. And then on each gill arch, there are several hundred gill filaments. And then on each gill filament, there are several hundred gill lamellae. And these lamellae are the location of this gas exchange, where oxygen enters the blood and carbon dioxide exits. Um, so if we wanted to be able to quantify how much oxygen a fish is able to take into its body, we would need to know how much surface area um, the gills possess. And to use that, we would utilize this equation right here, uh, multiplying the length of all the filaments, okay, multiplying the length of all the filaments by the number and area of the lamellae, which are the gill filaments. <laughs> Uh, gas exchange is occurring. Um, so relating this to the OPA, as I mentioned, the, uh, most of the heat is lost in the gills. So the OPA have a reed re morabili in the gill arches that is able to maintain um, the heat within the, the gills and around the surrounding tissues. If we were to look at the reed even closely, I mean more closely, um, we would see the anti-parallel blood vessels where the warm blood is represented as the red blood vessels and the colder blood is shown as blue. And you can see that they are 
right next to each other, enabling this cross current heat exchange to take place. If we looked at a temperature profile of the fish, we can see that the, the position of the reed is able for it, enables the fish to uh, maintain its entire body at, at an elevated temperature. Um, obviously, with the more warm areas around the, the brain and the location of the gills. Um, and this figure shows you what this would look like in the environment. This fish, um, this is a three hour time series with temperature and depth on the, on the y-axis. Um, and shown in the, in the red line is the internal temperature of the fish. And the blue line is the external temperature of the water. And you can see that the OPA has a much higher um, internal temperature relative to the highly variable and um, much colder external temperature. So my research was broken down into two specific research questions. How does the OPA gill morphology um, adapted to meet the metabolic demands of endothermy? And what are the ecological implications of these adaptations? With the overall objective of gaining a better understanding of the physiology and the movements of the OPA. So addressing the first question, I developed two hypotheses that the gill morphology would optimize the heat exchange in the gill reed and that it would increase the respiratory surface area in the gills. So to look at the first hypothesis, I removed um, a cubic centimeter of the gill reed from the dorsal and the ventral um, reed in the first gill arch, then cross-sectioned these um, samples and analyzed them under a light microscope. And here we have, here we have um, the blood vessels. Um, so the measurements that I, would, that I was interested in making were um, looking at the blood vessel circumference and the blood vessel diameter and the proportion and contact with adjacent blood vessels. So this is what I came up with. So on the top blue plots, we see that we have blood vessel diameter plotted with gill surface area and total filament length and the weight of the fish. And as you can see, as the fish increases in size and in respiratory capacity, the blood vessel diameter also increases, which is fairly intuitive. As you get bigger, you're gonna need more blood to supply your tissues. Now in the bottom plots, the red ones, we see the same X parameters plotted with the proportion in contact with the adjacent blood vessels. And again, you see a positive correlation with each of the three, um, suggesting that as the fish increases in size and respiratory capacity, as again, um, the fish, the, the blood vessels in the reed also um, increase in, uh, there is more heat exchange occurring between the blood vessels. So the, and to address the second hypothesis, I mentioned the gill surface area of the fish. And to do so, I use this equation one more time. Um, so what I would do is I would count the number of filaments on each gill arch. I would take measurements um, of representative gill filaments to calculate the average length. I would then remove those representative filaments and estimate the lamellar frequency by counting the number of lamellae per millimeter. I would then take out a representative lamellae and measure the area of the lamellae to get the overall um, gill surface area. So in plotting the data, this shows a comparative plot of several species of fish, as well as the measurements I, took, I made with the OPA. Um, and we have total gill surface area on the y-axis and mass on the x-axis. And keep in mind that these, this is a logarithmic scale um, plot. So uh, most marine teleos lie in the gray box region. Um, some of the more active teleos are right here. And then we have the regional endotherm. So these are the tuna, the marlin, and the swordfish. And right about here, sitting very high on the chart, is the OPA. Now, the, to make that plot, I use um, linear regression models of the log of the data. So that resulted in the general formula y equals a times m to the b, where a is a coefficient, m is the mass of the fish, and b is a scaling exponent that corresponds to the um, relationship between the oxygen demand, oxygen demand and the fish's body size. So looking at this plot again, we see that the OPA has a very high slope. Um, and it is highlighted in black. So where most fish have a scaling exponent of 0.8 to 0.9, the OPA has a scaling exponent of 1.16. So this shows that the gill surface area increases disproportionately with uh, the fish's body size, suggesting an increased capacity for endothermy as the fish grows. Um, so now I turn my attention to the ecological implications of this adaptation. Um, so referring back to this figure, we see Again, that the OPA has an elevated internal temperature relative to the external water temperature. Um, but there's an issue with this experiment. This fish was not, a free, was not necessarily a free-swimming fish. 
this fish was tethered to a rope and allowed to swim around the boat. So this was called Opa on a Ropa. Um, <laughs> so, so we wanted to know if this was similar to a free swimming fish. So what was done is that we captured Opa, uh, fitted them with a pop-up satellite archival tag that monitored the ambient water temperature, the depth, and the internal temperature of the fish. And then all these um, data were sent to me for data analysis where I created these plots. Uh, so this shows an individual fish over a time period of 36 hours. Um, and what you can see is that we have, the in we have depth and temperature on the y-axis and the internal temperature is shown as the red line. Um, and the external temperature is the blue line. Whereas the blue line is very variable, it's going up and down uh, very frequently. But the red line is always elevated and shows a lot less variability. So what I was interested in looking at with this data was um, some of the dives, the dives that this fish went through. So we see I selected two relatively short dives where it went down deep into the colder water, and then I selected this longer dive. Um, and then looking at them, notice that the two shorter dives, the fish spent about 30 minutes below 12 degrees Celsius. And in that time, the fish had 15.2 and 16.4 degrees Celsius internal temperature with the average temperature difference between the fish and the water being 4.9 and 5.2 degrees Celsius. And then looking at the longer dive, we see that yes, there is a noticeable decrease in internal temperature. However, this fish did spend an hour and 46 minutes below um, 12 degrees Celsius, and the average temperature difference between the fish and the water was actually 16.4, or sorry, 6.4 degrees Celsius. So this has uh, enormous ecological implications because this is showing that the fish frequently makes deep dives into the colder water um, where it is likely foraging for food. And by having an elevated internal temperature, the fish is able to um, outmaneuver and outswim many of the prey items that it is encountering as it um, enters these deeper waters. Um, and also, uh, warmer temperatures are just energetically a better uh, way of going about operating. Um, so now we have a better understanding of the ecological implications of why this fish is warm-blooded and how um, it benefits the fish. So in summary, both the blood vessel diameter and the, uh, the proportion in contact with adjacent blood vessels increases as the fish grows. The opa has an increase, um, a much higher gill surface area than most other fish, and the fish shows a disproportionately high increase in oxygen demand with increasing fish size, suggesting an increased capacity for endothermy as the fish grows. And finally, the fish makes frequent dives in the deep, cold, um, not often oxygen deficient waters. Um, so these findings are important for understanding the movements of the physiology, the life history and habitat preference of the OPA. Um, and they also are important for fisheries managers so that um, they may be able to make sustainable um, implementations um, for the future as the OPA continues to be a commercially important fish. So in the future, uh, more, depth, more in depth measurements regarding the REIT and the gill specializations of the OPA uh, will take place and continued OPA tagging because we still, we literally know nothing about the ecology of this fish. Um, so we need to gain a better understanding of the population structure and dynamics um, in order to ensure that this fish is um, around for a much longer time. Um, and personally, I plan on continue, continuing to study fish endothermy, um, as well as studying the movements and uh, migration patterns of highly migratory fish species and stock assessment. Um, so maybe I'll even go back to the Southwest Fishery Science Center in the future, assuming this presentation went well. Um, <laughs> it's not over yet. So <laughs> in conclusion, I would like to thank my mentors, Nick Wegner and John Hyde, as well as all the, the, the crew members and uh, people associated with the studies that I've referenced throughout this presentation because they did most of the uh, data collection for me. Um, and I would also like, like to thank the scholarship team um, for supporting me throughout my experience as a Holland Scholar. Um, and you might drop because this is over and I would like to take any questions at this point. <laughs> Fish and it is not, it is 
Uh, we, we literally know nothing about this fish, um, so we don't know how it reproduces, but any fish that has been caught has been one fish only. We would set out miles of long line, and we would only catch one within 10, 12 miles. Uh, because it's 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 semi rare, so it's not often caught. Um, but in the Hawaii, it's mainly in Hawaii that the opa are caught. Um, yeah, it's relatively rare. Um, but so there's no real way. We, and again, we don't know exactly where this fish is, so we can't target it without knowing you know, where it is. Um, so if they just happen to catch these fish through the tuna and the swordfish longline fisheries, um, and it's a delicious fish. I had some, so there's no it makes no sense to throw it. Away. It's highly marketable. Yes. So I didn't get to see from the sort of time series graph that you showed, but do you know if they're sort of making the monthly migration down with the plankton and back up? Or were you able to see that from the time data? Yeah, they weren't. Um, I can go back and show you. It, it was more just whenever the fish felt like it. Um, <laughs> there's no trend in when they're diving, um, it's just going up and down. It's likely coming back up because. As you saw by the, the middle dive, it got the temperature drop started to drop and it likely um, decided to come back into the warmer waters. You wanted to do something, or you said Yes. Okay. Would you like to join me? No. <laughs> I was gonna take a selfie with all of you. Would you all like to scooch in? Maybe I can get all of you in. That would be nice. Are you sure? <laughs> I was anticipating you at once. <laughs> what? No, not yet. It's still good stuff. Thank you. 